Welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 170. And for the first time in the show's history, I have a double interview feature for you. Now what's happened here that there are two really amazing Kickstarter projects out right now. And I think you should hear about these sooner rather than later. So hopefully you have enough time to hop over and make very generous pledges to both of them. Uh, the first one we'll be talking about is Hero U. This is being produced by Lori and Corey Cole, the uh, folks behind uh, one of the best adventure RPG hybrids ever, the Quest for Glory series. And I gotta tell you, their new game looks just as exciting. Uh, and after that, uh, we'll be hearing from David Marsh, who's the designer of one of my favorite uh, adventure games ever, Shadowgate. He's uh, also back with a new Kickstarter. He's got a really updated and expanded version of Shadowgate coming out that he wants to be the first in the whole series of new uh, Shadowgate games. Uh, really exciting stuff. We've got a lot to cover here. So without further ado, here is Lori and Corey Cole. Hi folks, I am here with Lori and Corey Cole. Uh, very uh, celebrated and famous uh, game designers. They've done Mixed Up Fairy Tale, Shannara, Castle of Dr. Brain, and of course the Quest for Glory series. Uh, how is that? You know, I'm really happy to have you on the show today, uh, both of you. I uh, hope everything is fine on your end. Beautiful Californian weather. Oh, it's uh, absolutely gorgeous. A little bit warm still. We're looking forward to the cooler season coming up. Waiting for fall. Excellent. Well, I was uh, doing some research on you uh, earlier. I noticed a lot of different projects and ideas and all sorts of stuff going on. So can you just summarize uh, what are you up to now? Well, we're about to have a Kickstarter to uh, create a new product, a new series, actually, which we're calling Hero U. And that, of course, is uh, short for Hero University, but it's also uh, because it's all about you. Uh, so we wanted to have the two meanings in the name. But it's based on uh, something we've done over the last six or seven years, which uh, is a website called The School for Heroes. Uh, and that was our way of uh, taking the ideas of uh, heroes in the games and bringing them into real life. And so sort of a combination of fantasy and uh, reality and uh, you know, making your life more effective by being a hero. Yeah, we've had a lot of things like... Um, what type of hero are you? So we had a, you know, an elaborate test at the beginning to see what would you do in this situation. It wasn't unlike, you know, the ancient Ultima tests to see if you were a paladin or a, uh, a wizard or a warrior. Because that's what we were doing effectively. We were saying people in real life have these qualities that we call wizard-like or leader-like for warriors. But of course, having fun with uh, exaggerating a little bit and saying that, uh, okay, you're uh, staying in a hotel uh, uh, somewhere in a strange city and you find a, a mysterious note has been uh, slipped under your door. Uh, and what do you suppose that note is? And it could either be a, uh, uh, you know, uh, a cryptic message uh, setting up a secret meeting uh, somewhere in the uh, catacombs, uh, or it could be... Uh, uh, your uh, admission into, uh, uh, you know, uh, into Cornell University, or uh, uh, you're going to be, uh, you know, your concert for Carnegie Hall is set up. So we have basically these different uh, choices that uh, kind of let you define yourself as uh, what kind of person you were, uh, and then we would assign you to a class that corresponded to like a Quest for Glory class. You're a, uh, you're a rogue, or you're a, uh, a fighter, uh, a warrior, or a wizard, and so on. So now we're going to turn it into a real game. Because that's what we kind of had in mind all along. But now is it's Is this an augmented reality project? Is that... Well, it wasn't so much augmented as a website base, so it wasn't very exciting visually. Yeah, that, that was our problem with the school. It was, uh, it was uh, great for teaching people, uh, you know, uh, ethical principles and, uh, uh, you know, the, and letting people, empowering people, letting them know they had skills. But... It wasn't much of a game, and uh, we had always intended it to turn into something that would be really fun to play, and uh, so, you know, education is nice and all that, but education works better if you're having fun doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was looking at some uh, an earlier interview with you, and I saw some uh, quotations about uh, education, educational games, and how they're actually very difficult to get right. You know, you oh, wanted it to be fun, but, you know, educational is... <laughs> You know, how do you do it? <laughs> well, you know, Quest for Glory did it really well. People were learning English. People were learning to type. 
you know, when it was Hero's Quest and the old parser games, they learned things that they wanted to learn, like how to type. And they didn't have to have a teacher telling them, this is how you do it. They were motivated, severely motivated to learn. And we don't want to scare anyone off by thinking that Hero U is, uh, you know, you're going to school to learn to be a hero. No, it is a, it is absolutely a, a game. It's uh, designed for fun foremost. Uh, and the way we did it in Quest for Glory is we've got our own kind of principles uh, sprinkled all through the games. And, uh, you know, we've heard it, we've gotten a lot of letters from uh, fans that, that get this, that say, you know, uh, I really hadn't thought of myself as a hero until I played this game. And now I realize it can be. Uh, so we want to make it so that, uh, uh, you know, you're having fun, but you're having fun in a way that, uh, you know, enriches your life. It's not just a substitute for life. Yeah, we're, we've got the concept of, of the idea that these, this is a story. We're going to tell a really good story with this. It may, it's, it's a role-playing adventure game, and it'll have... The, the more of the role playing aspects than the Quest for Glory series. So there'll be things like you'll you'll have dungeons to explore and you'll have abilities to increase and you'll have that layer of gameplay on it. But it still it's set in a school, you have other students you have to interact with, you have assignments from the teacher that you have to fulfill and you also have all this cool stuff you could be doing instead. So like real life, you have to kind of balance your life so that you don't, you know, burn out or you don't miss what you're there for. And uh, one of the things that I'm noted for is more the uh, uh, the puzzle side of things. And we're about, you know, we've had uh, some people like uh, uh, Quest for Glory 3 more that is a, a very storytelling and atmospheric thing and some people like two and four more that had more of an emphasis in the puzzles. Uh, so we're kind of dividing the labors here in design where Lori is going to be in charge of uh, making sure that uh, the character interactions are really rich and detailed. Uh, obviously we're brainstorming back and forth and what all the storyline is going to be. Uh, but I'm going to be looking into making it so that it's not just a hack and slash role playing game, but there's some real puzzles to solve as you uh, uh, go through that uh, uh, it's going to be a real challenge, a real mental challenge, uh, as well as uh, uh, game playing. I mean, the more I hear about this project, the more excited I, I get. You know, where's the, so the Kickstarter is up or it's it's going to be up or what's the? Uh, our uh, targeted date is uh, October 19, and we, we plan to run it uh, through uh, November 19, so that'll be 31 days. Uh, We're treating it like a game right now. We're taking a lot of time to develop the Kickstarter. We want the Kickstarter to be as fun to be, you know, as exciting for the player, for the supporter, as it is for us. I mean, we've got, you know, events going to come up. We're going to celebrate Halloween on Kickstarter. We're going to have, you know, bonuses that come up along the way. We really want our, 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 our you know, our fans, our viewers, supporters to really feel like this is exciting. You know, we're really creating something different and it isn't. It isn't what we've done before in the past. It's going to be new, but it's going to be fun, too. And we need to give that impression eat right from day one with the Kickstarter. Yeah, we, you know, we have our own kind of ethical considerations, and we didn't want to go and bring up a campaign and say, hey, people, support us because, hey, we're Corey and Lori Cole. And yeah, I mean, that's, that'd, that'd be enough for me. <laughs> well, you know, it might have worked, uh, but... Uh, Actually, that was uh, Chris Crawford's uh, bylines. Says, I am the greatest game designer in the world. And obviously, he had his tongue firmly planted in his cheek when he said it. But, uh, you know, that's not what we're about. We're, we're about providing value. And we're going to make a game that is a really new game. We don't want to do a, you know, rehash. We don't want to go back and uh, say, okay, well, it's time to uh, uh, make Quest for Glory 1 for the third time. Uh, we want to provide something new, and we've learned a lot about games and gaming and uh, and des design uh, over the last 20 years. And, uh, you know, we're going to be incorporating what we've learned, and we think it's going to be a more exciting and more fun experience uh, than we had before. Because we've been playing games all this time, too, so we know what we like, and we know what we want to see in a game, and that's always what it's been about. What do we want to do? What would be fun for us, and, and how would it be fun for the player? 
And it's all about thinking of design wise of what would the player want to do. So my greatest worry is, uh, you know, what if they uh, held a party, and nobody came? What if we held a Kickstarter, and nobody came? Is uh, uh, just getting eyeballs on the actual campaign, and then people can decide for themselves. They'll say, you know, does this sound like fun to me? Is this the kind of thing I want to play? Uh, and we think for an awful lot of people, the answer will be yes, and uh, they just need to find it. Do you have a funding goal in mind? Yeah, we're going for a very modest, uh, we think, funding goal of uh, $400,000. Uh, and then if people actually look at the way Kickstarter works, that means there's probably about uh, three quarters of that, about 300000 that's actually available for development. Uh, the rest are incidental costs and so on. Uh, we're hoping to raise a lot more than that. That's a very shoestring budget for any sort of a game. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, we're working with, uh, you know, we're working with professional designers. We're not... Uh, I mean, we probably could have done this entire game working with uh, fans doing it for free, and it probably would have taken five or ten years to get out. Uh, so, working with professionals, it's going to be expensive uh, uh, development costs. Uh, if we can raise the minimum, we know we can do the game. If we get more than that, we can make it better. Yeah, Are you, have you thought about the gifts? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, or yeah. The, the pledge, thought, uh, oh, what are they oh. called? I, I forget. Yeah, because that's the exciting part. I mean, it's all about, what can I get, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's a fine balance because we want to give people real value that have the premiums that they say, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy with this. And of course, the biggest premium is going to be the game itself. Uh, that, uh, but, you know, based on what other people have done with campaigns, we, you know, we can't go back to the uh, 90s and say, okay, this will be $60. Uh, you know, we're looking at uh, uh, either a $20 or $25 uh, price point with a, uh, uh, and early birds discount for people that get into the campaign early would be slightly cheaper than that. Uh, but it's a, it's a very fine balance. We don't want to, uh, if somebody doesn't hear about the campaign until weekend, we don't want to feel like they're not getting a good deal because they weren't there at the beginning. And we're going to add some specials along the way. Uh, we want to give people value, but we don't want to take the entire budget and put it into premiums. We really want that to go into the game and gameplay and better art, better music and so on. By the way, we have awesome musical score just based on the uh, uh, theme song that is uh, what we have so far. Yeah, so we're really excited. We think we've got going to have some great things. And my favorite premium that we're going to be offering is the Hero You yearbook. And you can have your picture in the yearbook and you can display it like it was your yearbook. And it'll be a little better than that because uh, uh, after all, all of our work is about empowerment. And so in addition to your picture in the yearbook, uh, you'll be able to submit a, sh a short paragraph about why you're a hero or some accomplishment that you're proud of. Uh, and we'll have that in the yearbook. And so we'll have an online PDF version of that that uh, probably everybody will get. Uh, and that everyone that pledges above a certain level will actually get a physical yearbook uh, with all the pictures of the game characters in it and a little biography of the game characters. And in addition, uh, uh, everyone who has pledged above that level, their picture and biography will be in there. So you can go find out about people and maybe make some contacts uh, for future and say, uh, oh, this guy's an artist, and uh, yeah, I'd like to get in touch with them. Or more to the point, it's got hints and clues in it. So people will want to look at the yearbook. It isn't just this thing you put in your shelf and never use in your life again. So it has practical value for the game, and it has va vanity value. It has pride value because... After all, wouldn't we really want to have gone to Hero U instead of wherever we wound up? Got a question here from a, a viewer, Chrono2012. He wants to know, uh, will your upcoming game incorporate both adventure game and RPG elements in a manner similar to the Quest for Glory games? Yes and no. <laughs> that was yes exactly what I was going to say. No. Yes, it will. It is definitely an adventure game. It has a strong story. It has a lot of interactions with other characters. It has all the classics that we put into, you know, classic storyline and story progression and characters that we put into the Quest for Glory. And uh, it's going to have the, the, the classic RPG that we put into uh, Quest for Glory. But the difference is, it's not going to look like Quest for Glory. Yeah, it's going to have a totally different look. We're, uh, we actually originally started out thinking of uh, uh, doing like a tile-based uh, rogue-type dungeon game. And 
we're going to incorporate that, uh, you know, the tile look. Uh, we're also going to have some close-up screens, but uh, that will depend partially on our budget. If, uh, you know, if we raise hundreds of thousands of dollars extra in the Kickstarter, then we can afford to have more art. Uh, but we're going to make it so that we have, uh, you might think of it as Quest for Glory boiled down to its essence. We're taking the, what we consider uh, the game, and, you know, that game could have been done as a text adventure. Uh, in a sense, uh, because it's all about the interaction with the characters and discovering the storylines and solving the puzzles, and that doesn't need a lot of graphics. Uh, but we're trying to do something in between so that you have uh, a real feeling that you are, you know, traveling through an environment, uh, but, you know, we're not putting our money into uh, fancy graphics. We're putting our money into uh, the story and the puzzles, and this will actually probably have richer character interaction even in a quest for glory. We're really pushing your relationships with characters as being important. Uh, so that when you talk to the same person, uh, depending on whether you've done the effort to build up a relationship with them, uh, then they will be more friendly with you and you'll get more information. Whereas they might be a little curt if, uh, you know, they don't like you very much. Yeah, so basically it is that whole concept of what we were doing with quest for glory but it's it's pushing the story a little more than the adventure game that it was uh and it's also not the same it's not about this anonymous hero that the player embeds all the, the way he talks what he thinks like which is what we were doing with quest for glory we wanted you to be the hero well in this time this game is more you're going to role play the role of a character who has a backstory, who has a strong story, more like the traditional adventure game style, and you have to learn more about the character you're playing as he learns more about the school, because he wasn't, you know, he doesn't know the school any more than you do when you come in. So you're learning about him, learning his backstory, even as he learns more about himself and his own backstory. So there's this mystery embedded over it. And you actually get to play this snarky, snide character who's coming into school because he doesn't want to, but he has no choice. And you get to, you know, be the obnoxious, you know, snarky character and have the fun of interacting with people like that. Yeah, for the, for this first game, for the road game, uh, we kind of think of it as the reform school for heroes. Uh, you're not there because <laughs> uh, uh, you want a great education. You're there because the alternative was going to prison. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, you have a very hostile environment. A lot of, uh, a lot of the teachers that, uh, know that you're a troublemaker, uh, and, uh, they really want you out of there. Uh, but somehow you've got to, uh, succeed in that. And then as you go along, you're going to discover that the school is just on the surface, that beneath the surface, there's a lot going on here. There's a, a political intrigue, a lot of things that, uh, really does need your skills. So you do get to be a hero, but you're a reluctant hero. All right, folks, I am here with Dave Marsh. He's the artist and director for ICOM Simulations, the company that brought us some of my favorite adventure games of all time, including uh, the Deja Vu series, Shadowgate, and uninvited. He's also a pioneer of the, the full motion video adventure game genre. Uh, some of the games he's worked on include the Sherlock Holmes consulting detective game and Dracula Unleashed. He's also done some sky, uh, side-scrolling games uh, for the Looney Tunes. And he's even written a novel, uh, which we'll post a link to that so you can nice. <laughs> read it after the interview. He's uh, done worked on massively multiplayer games, he's, uh, but now he's gone back to his roots uh, the really exciting uh, Kickstarter project. So, uh, Dave, what can you tell me about this Kickstarter project? So, um, we're actually kickstarting uh, Shadowgate again, and um, it's it's actually pretty neat because we had actually, uh, you know, over the years we have ported that game to eleven different platforms. Um, you know, from 1987 on the on the black and white Mac, all the way through, you know, IB, IBM uh, or PC uh, CGA to uh, the NES, Game Boy Color, Palm and Pocket PC, which some people don't know about. Um, and then, and then uh, in February of 2012, I reacquired the licenses to Shadowgate, Deja Vu, and Uninvited, and some Sherlock Holmes mysteries. 
And, um, but it would be a great idea to bring Shadowgate out again. So I got together and with uh, Carl Ruloffs, who is the other designer of Shadowgate. And over the years, we've been, um, we've been updating the puzzles, you know, uh, redesigning things. And we thought it would be great to bring Shadowgate out again, but not as a port. So we've actually um, redesigned it from, um, you know, keeping uh, many of the iconic rooms, but uh, redesigned a lot of puzzles. Um, you know, added things, added, uh, you know, a spell book and, uh, you know, expanded the inventory and um, tons of animation, uh, room environment animations, um, you know, all that's planned. So we thought if we want to do this right and finish it, um, you know, it would be great to, uh, you know, uh, talk to the fans and see if they want to help support it on Kickstarter. How different is this game going to be? Uh, from the original Shadowgate, is this if if you've already played the original, are you gonna uh, still want to play this one, or or is it different enough that it's like a new game? Oh, it's very different. I mean, the uh, there's a ton of rooms that are are the same. I mean, the the locations, the familiar locations. We like the idea of bringing if we're gonna bring Shadowgate back out, let's start with the original one before obviously before we would move on to make other games, uh, you know, under the Shadowgate universe. But what if you know we basically said what if we bring this out? We, um, we use uh, many of the original rooms, we create a ton of new rooms, we change the puzzles that um, maybe didn't hold up as well, maybe from 1987, uh, add new puzzles, um, do things that we've never done before, which is environmental effects, um, music, we have both um, you know, an orchestral soundtrack, plus we have the rights to the uh, original NES music, um, we would add a spell, you know, an entire spell book, um, you know, functionality to the game, a hint system that the game never had, um, and obviously, you know, full screen, which is something that the game has never really seen. And uh, so it is, it's very much, we're actually calling it kind of a reimagining of the game. Um, but uh, no, it's very different, and, um, but it's got this a, a familiar, uh, again, a familiar room, you know, many familiar rooms and a familiar storyline. So. Uh, and it still has uh, torches. So, <laughs> so yeah, we won't. I won't talk about the torches. But uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned a spell book a couple of times. Uh, that sounds like a pretty, you know, big departure from the original game. So, how's the spell book going to work? Right. So, one of the things that um, when we worked with Chemco um, back uh, in the, I guess it was late '80s, um, on the NES version of the game, um, you know, one of the things that that we talked about doing with them was, oh, sorry, um, was incorporating some sort of spell mechanism and so um, you know the original Shadowgate really didn't have that it was always just use uh, a scroll or use something on that but uh, now we've created you know an area that you can keep track of your inventory objects in one area and spells in another uh, we've even been talking about building spells and so um, you know it's just another way to expand on it to be able to solve puzzles using um, you know things that were more than just before where you know, you maybe found a scroll and you just operated that. So, I don't know if that answers your question, but it sounds great. So, what about those torches? Are you going to give us a <laughs> so, spell that just makes us have light all the time, or are we, are we still going to be desperate? Oh my God! Well, you know, last you know, the, flicker. The thing about Shadowgate was there were two things that were driving you, right? One was torches, and one was the Warlock Lord. So, in the case of the Warlock Lord, there were a certain number of moves that you know, that you had to complete the game before he went ahead and raised this Titan. And so, um, you know, that was important. The other thing about the torches there were we wanted to just make sure that it wasn't a game that you just wandered around forever, that there was some sense of urgency. So uh, we still have that in the game. Um, we're, we're excited about that. The difference is that we're balancing it out better than we did back in 1987. Obviously, after 20 some years, we've learned, learned a lot about gameplay balance. So we are definitely um, still having that, but it's not going to be uh, quite the sense of, uh, of urgency. Um, again, we'll, the, the torch is going to be on the screen at all times, so you'll be able to see um, you know, how it's doing and where you're going, but we'll make sure that um, you know, we have the right play balance there. So you're not going to make it too easy. No, we're not going to make it too easy. We don't want to do that. And um, you know, obviously there's always a challenge when you put out a game for um, a new gaming platform. So take the iPad, which the game will be out for as well, um, after we complete the PC and Mac version. And so 
there you have a different audience. It's not a hard, quite a, as much of a hardcore game audience. It may be more of a casual game audience. So it's going to be, um, you know, just just like any other game we've created, just making sure we balance it between that right amount of, of accomplishment and right amount of frustration. So. You know, Dave, one of, the, one of the things I love about the original Shadowgate game, and, and I hope you're going to tell me the scene is still in the game, because I'm going to be very upset if it's not. <laughs> is, uh, you know, you're, you're in this hallway, you're sort of corridor, you're looking, there's all this gold and treasure everywhere, and there's these eyes, you know, at the, in the dark. Right. And anytime you touch something, this flame comes out right. and roasts you for a while. Uh, I lo you know, it got to be one of the, my favorite scenes of, uh, iconic, yeah, out of any adventure game, uh, period. So please tell me you haven't gotten rid of the... No, that, that, um, that is in there. In fact, um, you can see it on the, the our first update for the Kickstarter um, site will be... Um, our musician, Rich Douglas, um, dropping in um, a great, uh, not just music, but a great sound design for that room. And um, you're, if you love that, if you remember that room and love that room, when you see that, you're going to be blown away. It's, um, it's really wonderful. Uh, just the where we've gone as far as the art and audio is just um, the, the shadow gate we've always wanted to make. So, but yes, that dragon room. Um, Gorum is the name of the dragon, by the way, nobody ever knew that, but um, that's in there. But there are some new puzzles uh, revolving around that as well, so it's pretty uh, it's pretty neat. Yeah, a lot of those, some of the more iconic rooms, that one, the um, the chasm, uh, you know, with the two bridges, um, you know, there's a good number of rooms that uh, people will really remember and say, oh, you know, I love that, that room, or... I got it, you know, it's that one scared the crap out of me and, you know, we, we kept those in there. But, um, but again, you know, we've gone through those puzzles and said, you know, does this puzzle make sense? Do we like this? Hey, let's add this new bit um, to the game or, you know, let's change out and, or put in a new, you know, these new two or three rooms in this section that will, um, you know, add to the experience. So uh, it's definitely going to be a different game. But, you know, a lot of those rooms that, that you liked, um, you're going to see and go, oh, I remember, I remember that, and it's awesome. Yeah. What's an example of one of the puzzles that you cut? Um, the like, for example, there's that room with um, where there's a rope on the floor. And, well, not the uh, Epor room. Epor room. <laughs> Everybody calls it the Epor room, right? Which is a rope spill backwards. We were, we were pretty smart back in 1987 as 20 year olds, you know. And um, and so there's a there's a puzzle that that we just didn't like. We just it was too easy. It was too easy to understand how to do it. And uh, so that room has been redesigned. In fact, when you see that room is completely flooded, uh, the word epor is still written on the wall, um, kind of as an homage to to the room. But that room's flooded, and that whole puzzle is how am I going to go ahead and um, you know, there's areas you can see down below. How am I going to get down there? Because every time I try to go down there, I, you know, I, I run out of breath. So, and of course it puts out my, tor my torch. So that's a design, you know, room for, for example, that, you know, we, we really liked the room, but we didn't like that puzzle. And so, um, but again, you know, we kind of left a, a bit of it in there just as a paying homage to it and, you know, just saying, uh, you know, it's the shadow gate we love. So, so now you got a scuba written backwards on the wall somewhere. Yeah, it's it's actually still <laughs> scribbled up there. You can kind of make it out and everything, but um, it's a it's a much tougher room to figure out how to get past. So, yeah, I was wondering too if you could give me an example of a new room. Um, yeah, you know, uh, we did some stuff. Uh, the the courtyard is an example um, with the cyclops in it. We've actually removed him. Um, we just uh, you know as we looked through that particular room and we said you know what is there about that room that we like and that we don't like. And one of the things that we wanted to do was, um, I guess this is another update room. You know figure out how to go ahead and lower the drawbridge. So that's a completely new puzzle. Um, we have a, an area that we've been building on into the towers that uh, the towers in Shadowgate were uh, fairly short. I mean, as far as the number of rooms that were in that game, you have to remember that we were trying to fit this thing on a floppy. And so most of the game had to do with the fact that we just didn't have the, um, you know, the, the ability to make any more rooms. And so the new platform allows us to make a lot more rooms. So we've actually been building onto the towers um, and uh, adding a little bit more there. The Sphinx room, for example, um, which we still like, which was, we always liked the riddle part of that. 
um, we've added on so that um, if you really want to get past him, the areas that are past him are um, are unique and new. I, I hate to really go into where the design is on that, but um, it actually takes you into a unique area um, of Shadowgate that's really we had never touched on before. So. Is that, I'm not sure does that answer your question without giving too much away. Yeah, you got. I mean, I'm really curious now about. Yeah. I'm going to run to the Sphinx as soon as I get the new game. Yeah, and we're also looking at some of the areas that you couldn't get past before, and uh, you know what what was behind there, what was the thing, and um, part of it was trying to you know figure out um, you know if we could add more rooms that would build upon the story. Because really, in those days, again, we didn't have a lot of room, so we didn't really extrapolate, you know, what is it, why is it that Lackmere had sent you here, the wizard? What is it about the Circle of Twelve that you read about in the library? How did the one guy, Talamar the Black, who becomes the Warlock Lord, why is he the way he is? And what did he do, you know, what did the Circle of Twelve do when they found out that he was, you know, practicing black magic? And so we're really, we, we try to go into that um, more, and you actually end up seeing... Um, like one of the new rooms, which is the throne room that's been pretty much destroyed because of Talamar. So you learn a lot of things there. So um, neat stuff, just adding more to the mythos uh, that we never got a chance to before. And so um, we're really we're really excited between the, the new design we're working on and then the, the, the art style and, and the audio. And just between those three things, it should be pretty, um, if you want the more epic, Shadowgate um, that still feels kind of like what you remember. Um, then you'll have, and of course, all those great death scenes. So, you've uh, mentioned this is going to be out on Windows, Mac, iOS, Android. Right. How are these? Are these versions? Are you trying to make them as similar as possible to each other, or are they uh, big changes uh, between the platforms? Well, really, the big changes um, are not going to be in gameplay, but they're going to be in the user interface. Um, we're really targeting uh, the mouse-driven, um, obviously, platforms, the Mac and PC first, to make sure that it's an awesome game experience on those uh, platforms first. And then we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and tackle um, the, uh, the touchscreen devices. Um, only because we're just not big fans of wanting to make something that has to be, you know, vanilla, you know, vanilla or genericized or whatever um, for everything. So. Uh, we're definitely looking at that Mac and PC version first. Um, we know that there's a lot of Mac and PC fans out there. And then we'll go ahead and, um, again, the the, the storyline, the rooms, the puzzles will be the same, but um, how you interact with it will be different. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Now, I'll have links in the show notes to both of these Kickstarter projects, so please uh, go there right away and make your pledge. Uh, don't put it off, or you might end up forgetting, and then we might actually run the risk of not getting uh, one of these goals, or one of these uh, Kickstarters to their funding goal, and that would be a great tragedy for all gamers like us. So, please, right now, go uh, pledge to their Kickstarters, and while you're feeling generous, uh, also go to armchairarcade.com, make a donation to support this show by clicking on, on the uh, Matt Chat link there. You can make a donation of any size, and I always appreciate it, guys, and it is very necessary to keep these episodes coming, so thank you very much for supporting the Kickstarter projects and Matt Chat. Also, um, I would like to announce, I guess, that. I'll be posting a Facebook poll. I'm sort of drowning in interview footage at the moment. I've got an interviews with Joel Billings of SSI, uh, the rest of my interviews with Josh Sawyer, Lori and Corey, and uh, David Marsh. A lot of stuff piling up, so I'm going to put up a Facebook uh, poll there. Uh, so you can tell me uh, which of the interviews you'd like to see me produce next, and I'll uh, take that into consideration for next week. So thanks very much. Now what about that Ale of the Week? Uh, this week I have uh, an ale from New Belgium Brewing Company that's out of Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, this is their Trippel, uh, Triple, Trippel, not really sure how you pronounce that, ale brewed with coriander. That's a very strong beer, or ale rather, a 7.8% alcohol uh, by volume. Uh, supposed to be in the Belgian style. Uh, with just a trace of coriander, so I'm not really sure what coriander is supposed to taste like, but uh, let's get this open and see what it's all about. So I got the old drinking horn filled with this 
uh, Trapel, and I'm really excited about this because it smells great. Kind of got this lemony, citrusy smell. If you can smell something like this and not want to drink it, I guess you just don't like ale. I want to toast uh, this week to a very special Match Hat fan named Dennis. So here's to you, Dennis. Let's give this one a taste. Really nice, uh, uh, really smooth actually, uh, considering it's got so much alcohol. I can't even taste the alcohol in this. Uh, not bitter at all. It's kind of a, a sort of a caramel. It's um, actually kind of a thick texture, too, kind of milk, almost the you know rather thick ale. Uh, quite quite nice. Uh, quite smooth. The flavor is you know there's a lot of. Uh, complexity I guess in the in the aftertaste you taste this and then you sort of get the stuff going on in the back of your throat but it's all quite uh, quite pleasant actually this is a really really good good choice here it's all around really really smooth drinkable uh, lovely ale here I think I'm gonna have to go uh, four out of five drinking horns on this really really good choice you know I could probably uh, you know, if I didn't know any better, I think this was a genuine Belgian uh, Trapel. Now, they've really done a good job with this, so I highly recommend this. This is the Trapel from the new Belgian Brewing Company. Let's uh, wrap up with a quotation, and uh, this week's quotation comes from a designer named Frank Camiro. And it goes something like this. People ignore design that ignores people. See you guys next week. What's this stuff? You've never seen a music video before? Uh-uh. I've been gone for eight years. Gone where? Outer space? Could be.